Welcome to our online worship service. We are glad you are joining us today. Let's begin by praying the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And praying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises, declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and sincerely believe his holy gospel. For this reason we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that at the last we may come to his eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed saying together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God.
A reading from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John, beginning with the 14th chapter, the first verse. And Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still did not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the last couple of months, we've been introduced to a new vocabulary, words and language having to do with COVID-19. One of the expressions often used is social distancing. It's two words, of course, social and distancing, but together it's taken on a meaning of its own. And we've come to see that this practice of keeping safely apart distancing shapes and in many ways limits us from doing things we were so used to doing just weeks ago. The thing that makes social distancing particularly challenging is, well, distancing. We distance ourselves, intentionally so, from friends, work colleagues, and fellow students. Some of us are unable to visit members of our immediate and extended families. Even if we drove all day or flew in a plane to visit, we would still need to remain physically distant and apart once we arrive. In this season of exile, friends, we are discovering just how much being human hinges on our being physically present with other humans. Being apart can be painful. It brings a kind of grief to life. Even the anticipation of being separated from a loved one can take the wind out of one's sails. And this is not unlike when Jesus' closest friends begin to really grasp and understand that he would be leaving them, leaving them to face his road of suffering and death, which we just read from John 14 moments ago. Their friend, Jesus, who they had come to appreciate as much more than a friend, shared with them that he was now leaving. The disciples had traveled and lived with Jesus, shared meals, attended weddings, and festivals of praise and worship. His prayerfulness and his way of life had drawn them in so deeply and closely they had tasted the kingdom of God. They had watched up close and personal Jesus healed people physically, mentally, spiritually, and with remarkable wisdom and authority, dressed down religious leaders who tried to get in the way of anyone wanting to know the heart 
and the love of the Father. He sent out his friends. He sent out his followers into surrounding communities and neighborhoods and told them to invite everyone and everybody. Tell them, he said, repent. Turn back to God. His kingdom is at hand. Go tell people this. Invite everyone. And now, you're going to leave us? Even while facing his own anguish for what he was about to endure, Jesus was moved and concerned for his friends. He could tell they were worried and anxious about being separate and apart from him. And so he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And then he offers them a kind of antidote, a kind of medicine for their troubled and anxious mind by telling them to believe. Actually, the word here for believe is, is closer to the word trust. Trust in God. Tr trust me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust me. And this is more than an intellectual assent, believing theoretically or theologically that there is a God, for example. This kind of believing trust is when one has confidence in something or someone. Enough confidence that one acts on it, does something about it. In coming to church today, I trusted that my wheels were appropriately attached and fastened, that the lug bolts were tightened enough. I had enough confidence, in fact, that it led to the action of my driving my car here. In other words, I engaged with the believing trust that led to an action based on the confidence I had in what I was trusting. Let me say that again. I engaged with the believing trust that led to an action based on the confidence I had in what I was trusting. Of course, this illustration of the car doesn't do us justice because Jesus wants us to believe he's more trust, trustworthy than an automobile. But nonetheless, it helps. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust me. Trust me. Well, why? Why, why should we trust you? And as if Jesus anticipates the question and he wants his friends to know there's reason to trust him, that being apart from him is only temporary, he says, listen, there are plenty of rooms to live in my father's house. If that wasn't the case, wouldn't I have told you? I'm going to get a place ready for you. And if I do go and get a place ready for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you can be there where I am. He encourages them by telling them about his father's house, a term we hear elsewhere in chapter 2 when he's speaking about the temple, that place where for the people of Israel, heaven and earth intersected. Jesus is going to prepare a place for them in the domain and presence of God where there'll be lots of room, lots of rooms for everyone. He is reassuring his friends and his disciples that though he is going away, he's not leaving them. This is not a permanent distance. It's actually for their own good that he's leaving. And then he adds almost nonchalantly, you know, you know the way where I'm going after all. And Thomas says, well, actually, we, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way, Jesus? And then Jesus says words that challenge our modern sensibilities in so many ways. He tells them something that's so key to everything. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you do know him. You've seen him. Well, this is a pretty exclusive claim that Jesus is the only way out of any number of paths to God. In our culture, 
Being exclusive is often interpreted as intolerance, the polar opposite of open-mindedness. And so Jesus' claim is for many outrageous, it's scandalous. It may in fact be the greatest scandal of the gospel that of all of the possible worldviews and belief systems, Jesus invites us to trust him alone. Well, how do we respond to his claim that he's the only way to God the Father? After all, aren't all religions equally the same? Well, that's appealing actually. It, that all religions are the same. It has a nice, peaceful Canadian sound to it. But there are a number of inherent problems to this view. For one, if all religions are the same, then each one would only be a partial representation of something else, a reflection, perhaps, of some greater ultimate reality behind the many religious views, which would mean that all religions may mean something, but that the ultimate God reality would be unknowable, and no religion or person could ever have unobstructed and direct access to the true God. One writer summarized it this way. What you're really saying if you claim that religions are all the same is that none of them are more than distant echoes, distorted images of reality. You're saying that reality, the divine, God is remote and unknowable and that neither Jesus nor Buddha nor Moses nor Krishna gives us direct access to it. They all provide a way toward the foothills of the mountain, not the way to the summit. We might also add that while we may find common values shared by different religions, like the golden rule of treating others as you'd like to be treated, Many world religions actually contradict each other. Some teach there isn't a personal God, or that there are many gods, or that God or gods are unknowable, they're undisclosed, they're unrevealed to humanity. Some religions don't believe in evil, the idea of grace, divine mercy, to name just a few distinct differences. And adding to the challenge of the notion that religions are essentially the same, Andy Bannister writes that this, actual, this idea actually, quote, ignores a fundamental truth about reality. Ideas have consequences. What you believe matters because it will affect what you do. To claim that all religions are essentially the same is to say that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. And this neglects the fact that you can believe something sincerely and be sincerely wrong. Hitler held his beliefs with sincerity, but that doesn't make them true. We can also observe that this exclusive claim of Jesus isn't something found only in the Gospel of John. The communities of Christian believers in the New Testament, which also lived in pluralistic and multi-religious cultures, were unequivocal in their understanding, their writing and teaching, that the creator of the world, the one and true living God, had acted through the people of Israel to bring rescue and salvation to all cultures through Jesus the anticipated Messiah. His claim as the way, truth, and the life wasn't edited or added in as an afterthought, as a, an addendum to the story of Jesus by the early church. It runs through the entire New Testament. In the book of Acts, for example, the close friend and follower of Jesus who actually denied knowing him three times publicly pronounced in front of many people there's no, there is salvation in no one else but Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we might be saved. Can we trust Jesus? Can we, can we trust Jesus with his claim to be the way and the one to bring us redeemed and forgiven into the eternal presence of God? Our cultural script would say, no, it's, it's arrogant and naive to suggest there's one way. No one has a claim on truth. Yours is yours and mine is mine, so says the popular mantra. I think, however, that we actually care a lot about truth. We may be comfortable with the idea that all religions are the same, that there's no such thing as truth, 
apart from its relative meaning to a particular community, but I'm not sure we would say this about any other subject in life. If when visiting my mechanic, he tells me I need new rear brakes, but when I pick up my car at the end of the day, he tells me that he installed a new transmission, transmission instead, I'd have to ask him, why, what were you thinking? And if he answered that, it doesn't really matter whether you needed new brakes or transmission. Truth is relative, so I put in a new transmission. If he, if he said that, well, I'd have to disagree and perhaps find a very good lawyer. Truth matters. We care about it. Many years ago, when I was having a regular medical checkup, my doctor noticed some anomalies in my blood work. He rec recommended running some additional tests and reported back, that I needed to see a specialist. What for? I thought to myself with, in disbelief. I feel fine. But off I went, saw a doctor who specialized exclusively in this area of the human anatomy. He went through me with the fine tooth comb, and to be honest, I didn't like it at all. Not at all. Furthermore, when he concluded that I had, when he concluded that I had a serious health condition, which if left untreated would like likely kill me, I thought to myself, I feel fine, I'm great, there's lots of energy there, there's got to be a mistake here. A few weeks later, though, I went back to see my family physician who read the diagnostic report along with a detailed prognosis that had been written up by the specialist. And if he didn't catch me the first time, he happened to be an expert in the field. How did I respond to this news? How did I respond to this report? Did I say, what does he know? That's just his opinion. No, not this time. I received the diagnosis and prognosis from this one who had the authority to know what he was talking about. I understood and trusted this specialist enough to place confidence in his guidance, advice, and treatment. And to this day, I'm very grateful to these medical doctors. They saved my life by sharing truth with me. Jesus is inviting us to trust him, his claims, his diagnoses of our need, and his preparing a place for us in the presence of God where we are no longer distant and apart from him. This one who is the way, the truth, and the life has diagnosed our heart sickness of self-worship and remedied our situation through his self-giving death and death-defeating resurrection. In doing so, he has prepared a place for us in the presence of God for now and for the future when Christ returns. This morning, friends, we have an opportunity to consider and respond to something of great importance. And I'm putting this out particularly to those who may have never said yes to Jesus, to his diagnosis that we need to be reconciled with the living God. Jesus' life, his way of living, the power of forgiveness that comes through his death and resurrection has been extended to you as homecoming from God the Father. In his death, he took on all the sin and brokenness of humanity and the world, and in his resurrection overcame the permanence of death, sin, and hopelessness. God welcomes you home unconditionally accepted and loved. Jesus told us the way to receive this gift of homecoming. It's, it's by repenting by turning from self-worship and self-obsession and saying yes with your life to acknowledge God's offer of mercy and forgiveness, to say yes to Jesus through faith and baptism, by surrendering to him, living for him, following him, and trusting him. Today is the day you can do this. Will you trust God? Will you trust Jesus? Will you trust him with confidence to act and respond to his invitation? Let's continue our worship service with the prayers of God's people.
Let us pray. We pray for God's grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, through your grace, we are your people. Through your Son, you have redeemed us. In your Spirit, you have made us your own. We pray for the Church of God. We pray for the Anglican Church of North America, Archbishop Foley Beach. We pray for the Anglican Network in Canada, Bishop Charlie, and the other uh, bishops and clergy. We pray for the Lord's grace to be upon all of the clergy during this difficult time that we're living through. We pray for St. Hilda's Church. Make our hearts respond to your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. And we continue to pray during this pandemic as things begin to open up. We pray for protection upon your people. We pray for wise leadership throughout the world, in our own province and in Canada. We pray for our Prime Minister and for all those in authority that they would make godly and wise decisions. Make our lives bear witness to your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those in any kind of need, sickness, financial difficulties, mental distress, any kind of trouble. We lift up within our hearts right now those people that are on our mind. In faith, we bring them before the throne of grace. So just take a moment in your heart to think about and to pray for those in your family, your friends, situations that you know of. Bring those dear people to God right now. Make our wills eager to obey and our hands ready to heal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for all the blessings of this life, for the provision of God, and especially for our faith in the Lord Jesus, for the hope that we have in him both now and forever. We give you thanks, Lord, for the ways you take care of us. We continue to pray and bless you, Lord, this day. Make our voices one with all of your people in heaven and on earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gathering all our prayers together, we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And let's pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. 
Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful week.